Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes here with Chuck Manley and Scoot Mune, as we like to call him for the show. And today Always. we're joined uh, by the best selling award winning author Karen Travis, all the way from, uh, I think, across the ocean there in, uh, in uh, Great Britain. She doesn't have video today, and uh, we're rolling with that. And uh, welcome to everybody that's here. So, Karen, thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. It, uh, it it was interesting when when Lauren um, came with came to us and said, "Hey, we need to get Karen on the show." Um, it was really cool because uh, I'd, I'd I'd I've been in the the GE universe. I've written in in Galaxy's Edge and talked with all the other authors in Galaxy's Edge except for you. And so I, I'm really excited to finally get your take on that universe and and get um, what you wanted to do from your story, The Best of Us. Um, uh, because I think out of all the authors that have written in the universe, um, your take on it is the most unique um, and also the most um, detached from the 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 the, the common story uh, line that that takes place uh, after Legionnaire. Um, so I'm really excited to get in that conversation, and then also with with all the other writing that you've done, we can talk about it uh, uh, i don't the, the list is is ridiculously long um and uh i'm i'm excited to have you on the show so thank you for coming and, and hanging out with us today uh let's see uh Unif unity 151 sci-fi booktube was the first comment uh so he gets the keystroke medium golf clap of appreciation thank you unity um we've got a lot of facebook users however um they did not click the let's stream yard look at your name which i think is the most ridiculous thing about stream yard is i can't silly. see who their name is right uh, so let me see if i can bring that up you know facebook's all about privacy and that's right, right. <laughs> exactly that's right exactly. Uh, that's like give me all your information i will give you nothing uh unless you're stream yard unless you're stream yard that's right um i don't see where ours is i'll find it later um let's talk about what we've been up to this week i'm gonna go first uh yeah, as I you should. Not, I did not win the Dragon Award. I don't know if you guys saw that or not yesterday. Uh, I did not win. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick and Jason won for their uh, novel, uh, The Savage Wars, which coincidentally is also in the Galaxy's Edge universe. Um, so props to them. Bravo to them. Uh, it was a, a really tough group of authors to be up uh, against, if that's the right word, or be, to be with included with. Um, so that was really cool. And I'm glad that they won. Uh, there was a whole bunch of other really cool. First of all, the only one that I was like really suspect of, of, of winning was sky, uh, the rise of Skywalker. It, it won best, uh, movie, I think. Out of all yeah, the categories, sci-fi movie, yeah, sci-fi movie. Out of all the categories, I was like, really? That's the one that won. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to know is how is readers' Joe choice or viewers' choice Henry. in that case? Yeah, jo I, that's that's the other thing I didn't. I'm very confused by that. Joker fell in with the uh, sci-fi. Was it a sci-fi fantasy movie? It's yeah. the same category, yeah. right? Yeah, the category. But I'm like, okay, I get. It's just about a guy that kind of goes nuts and puts on makeup. I mean, you know, it's there's there were no fantastic elements to it. So I well, didn't understand why it was in that category. And and I don't know if we talked about it last show or not, but it was one of those things where if you if it hadn't been the Joker, like if that hadn't right. been the the title character, that movie really could have been anyone. Like oh, yeah, it could it have been any yeah, absolutely guy named Bob. Yeah. Bob. And yeah. wouldn't that have been great if they'd have just named it Bob? Bob. Like and then everybody is like Bob was the best movie. Ever. It's kind of like falling down with Michael Douglas from the yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a super well done movie. I just, yeah, I don't. I didn't get why it it ranked that. But only, hey, it's a popularity contest. Anyway, I've only so seen right. I've only seen the pitch pitch meeting on the Joker, so I need to watch that. <laughs> wow! 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 Wow, well, besides wow. losing the Dragon Award, what else were you up to today? Uh, let's see. Uh, what else did I do? Uh, I, whoa, we finished the first draft of Tranquility um, last week. And so now I am going through and doing the dev edit. Uh, edit, um, And hopefully that should only take a couple more weeks. And then we'll send that off um, to Athon. Um, apparently we're already in talks with the cover artist. Um, so I'm really eager to see the initial concepts because I've got a really specific vision in mind. Um, and I hope that they, uh, get it, uh, but we'll see if they don't, I'm sure it'll be an awesome cover and, and it could be something that I don't even have in my head. 
and it's going to be way better than I've seen. Uh, so um, we we're about halfway through plotting book two, and uh, and I think Devin just hit in chapter nine, so we're at like twenty thousand words on book two. Yeah, I think I was going to mention wait until my turn to mention that the show is still starting soon. Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for that, man. Uh, I was at, waiting for a time to slip it in there. But, at some time, um, we are going to start the show. You know, what's interesting about that is we've been doing it on StreamYard for I don't know how long, and I've only done that twice, where I just left the starting soon. Next time, I'm going to do a show and just leave the starting soon up the entire show. You and that way, everybody's say, like, okay, when's the show going to start? You yeah. should say it has started That's now. That's the level of professionalism sure. you're dealing with, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, but that's all I had uh, this week. Uh, Chuck, what about you? Uh, still clicking away on Jack Dark Book 2 for Athon. Um, working on some notes to finish up the third Brace Cordova book, which really, once I get started actually drafting on it, shouldn't take me more than a month or so. Nice. Uh, my oldest daughter, welcome to new grandbaby into the world. My fourth. Congrats. Grandpappy uh, Chuck. Papa Chuck, baby. I'm going to have to put another P in there at some point. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, just, and besides that, it's just the usual, you know, kids and fam, you know, taking care of the family, writing my books and right. living life, dude. That's about it. Oh, I did go out and throw softball and stuff with my daughter for the first time since uh, softball season ended. Yesterday, we went to one of the empty fields and I don't feel so good today. I was, I was just going to say, did you throw a hip out? No. Well, I was I was hitting the ball, and I probably haven't hit a softball in, I don't know, 30 years. <laughs> and uh, this is the shoulder that I dislocated back in 2010. So, like, it's it's not it's, – it's telling me about it today a little bit. But, but, but did you crush it? You're like, yeah, I crushed it. I, I, pop, it I popped a few, man. I popped a few out there, but I think those are the ones I hurt myself on. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's the things you're like, oh, I could do this every day. And then you wake up the next day. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you might be able to do it, but you're going to spend a week paying for it. Yeah, for sure. That's like uh, like when I, I did um, hardwood floors in my house a couple of years ago. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. Well, we'll take it a couple of days. It'll be fine. And then like the whole first day I did it, I was feeling okay. And I woke up the next morning and could not get out of bed. I had to literally yep. do yoga in bed to get out of bed because I was Been so there, sore. brother. Been there. Never what about you, hard Scott? Scott. Uh, almost, almost finished with uh, Victory Day, and working on. Um, we renamed it All for One. I'm sorry, One for All this is the third book in my Athon trilogy. The narrator is hammering through the first two books. He's already halfway through the second book, so we should be good for a launch of that series in October. Uh, other than that, I had most of the week off due to some procedures and medical checkups, which are all normal, run-of-the-mill stuff, and everything's good. And I learned to ramp rush last night in Fortnite with my nine-year-old, <laughs> and I'm telling you, we're going to dominate. So, ramp. Okay, explain that. Is that where you're yeah, building the so, thing? In, <clears throat> so in Fortnite, you can shoot people obviously and jump, but you can also build things. And so a ramp rush is when you you somebody's shooting at you. So you quick build a wall in front between you and them. And then you build a ramp onto that and you run up to the top of the ramp and then you can shoot down on them. But then you can oh. also, but then you can also build walls around yourself in the ceiling to protect yourself while you're healing up and stuff. And my son is so fast that if I build like, I build a square around myself to, to shelter, he's so fast. He can run up, knock my wall, one of my walls down, rebuild the wall, edit the wall with a window and then pop through and shoot me before I can know what he's doing. <laughs> See, and I'm, I'm not I sure. Can't. I'm not sure why that's a good tactic, but it is psychologically devastating. I'm just gonna tell you right <laughs> that's why I can't do Fortnite, man. Like yeah. I tried, but then like every time you get on and you're listening to like the people talking back and forth or whatever, and then you have like this eight year old from somewhere that's just, that's just killing you and laughing at you. And I'm like, I can't, I can't take this. I don't even know what you just did. And then I'm dead. Yeah. 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 Well, I came in down here this morning and he's playing rumble, I guess, which is like battle Royale, like times 10 or whatever. And the whole screen is like all these ramps and they're built to the sky. And they're like this maze that's in three dimensions where everybody is building and shooting each other and knocking each other's ramps. And so they run, shoot and build all at the same time. It's really impressive. I mean, 
obviously being trained for an alien invasion <laughs> because they'll be all like when we give them these spaceships. It's, it's actually in one of my the book I'm writing right now. And you give them these spaceships, they'll be able to do all these crazy things because they've been playing video games their whole life. That's my theory. Is that your theory? Makes yeah, sense. It. Mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, what about you, Karen? Have you done anything interesting this week in your uh, writing life or just in general? Uh, it mostly in involves solvent. <laughs> I had a lot of jobs to do. I had a lot of jobs to do around the house, and um, yeah, the first job involved some plastic filler for wood that said "ventilate the room." And I thought, I'm from Portsmouth. I'm just too tough to ventilate the room, you know. <laughs> 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 uh, so having learned my lesson, I had some scotch guarding to do today. So I took it outside and I stood outside and I sprayed this item and I scotch guarded it and I was really smug about it. And I walked back in the house and the wind had blown it all back in. <laughs> so oh. I just walked into a cloud of it. So if if I sound a, a, a bit hoarse and spacey, I, I, this is this is not voluntary solvent abuse. This is solvent <laughs> not abusing me. So uh, I'm not sure what difference it's going to make to the writing, but I'm on. I'm, I have been rewriting the sequel to uh, The Best of Us, Mother Death. This is my eighth re rewrite. And... I'm driving Jason mad because I'm not letting anyone see it because I'm, you know what it's like. I actually never used to do this, but once I start rewriting, it's like pulling the thread on a sweater. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you really, know, yeah. it's just, totally. you know, next time I'm going to go back to my old methods of, yeah, that that's it. One one take, that's it. But um, yeah. so. You got to um, know when to say good enough, right? Yeah, well, Thursday not perfect was the was the uh, watchword of someone I used to work for. I mean, he never stuck to that, but it's actually not a bad. It, I mean, you know, you're never going to get anything perfect, but I right. need to get out of this loop, and the solvent didn't get me out of it. So, right. well, the good thing about that, doing the solvent writing is now you have a legitimate excuse, and you're like, I don't remember writing I that, and then you can. <laughs> I don't actually remember writing anything I write. That is, that is, that is a genuine. That is a genuine problem. I That's mean, it. It's interesting because I, I, I was thinking yeah. back to a series, and I was trying to remember the name of a character from a series I wrote a couple of years ago, and I and I wrote on it for nine months, and I was I was like, "That's the main character's name," and then, and then it came back eventually. But yeah, I just same. Who was, there was a a speaker at twenty books that said the same thing. He's written so many books yeah. that, that he doesn't really look back. Yeah, I mean, volume of books. I mean, certainly, if you're trying to create this sort of uh, uh, perfectly detailed universe and you keep doing it 28 times, there is a limit to how much you can stuff in the brain. Um, right, yeah. You know, and there's nothing you can do about it. But, I mean, part of it is the way I write that I, I, I'm actually thinking as someone else. So when I'm trying to remember as me, it's like, I, seriously, I just... Uh, I feel such an idiot because I will I sort of get mail from readers who say, can you tell me what you meant by blah, blah, blah? And I'm thinking... Did I write that? So I get the book out and I, and I think, did I write any of this? Because none of it sort of resonates with me. So yeah. I think I'm sure I didn't use that phrase. And I go because you know I'm like I'm an absolute meticulous note keeper. I've kept every every version of everything for about the last twenty years. And I look at it, I think, oh, oh, I did do that, didn't I? Oh, I can't remember a collection of it, you know. And that and that is the. And that's the case I'm going to put when when my when when I'm on trial. I honestly don't remember doing it. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, um, I it's have a journal. No, I'm, glad I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one because I, I know exactly what you're talking about there. I mean, not well, being able to remember characters' names really is that is that is the worst. Though I mean, you feel so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> or just or a little like well, I had I had a co-writer. Uh, Cheney called me. He says, "What time of what type of beer does Kane write?" is one of my characters in the series with him. And so I, fortunately I have everything in Scribner so I can search the whole series and I searched all of the beer scenes. So what's interesting about the beer scenes for Halleck Kane in, in that series is almost all of them are in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> he's always drinking in the shower, smoking a cigar, leaning out, but most of just, the rest of the time he's killing people. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. But, but no brand of beer. So I was like, well, you know, it could be anything. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned uh, your your type of writing or how you do it, and you get into the characters' heads. And you and over your career, you, you've written a lot of characters in a lot of different settings. Um, so, how is it like right now? You, you say your 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 process is kind of different now, going through this this second book. Um, what is your process generally like? 
Well, it depends what you mean by process, whether, whether, you're, whether you're talking about the order in which I write. I mean, one yeah. thing that's never going to change, and I can't change because I don't know any other way to write, and that's I do it as as a computer model. That's what's in my head. That's sorry. I'm just using shorthand for this because you know once you start um, getting in, into the detail, it doesn't make sense. But um, I I never had a story in me waiting to get out. I never intended to be a novelist. It was someone else's idea, and I'm very grateful to that person because you know, I needed to change jobs. I really wanted out of the job that I, I was in, and this person very kindly, uh, while I was on a training course. Uh, and I said, I really don't want to do this job any, anymore. He said, well, you're not waste, wasting my time. Let's let's find another career for you. Do you want to go back to journalism? No, I'm getting too old. Do you want to do this? No. And it went to all these things. And it's like, do you have any hobbies? Do you do anything after work? And I said, well, you know, I like cooking. And do you want to run a restaurant? Nope. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's too much like hard work. Uh, you know, gardening? No. And it's like, oh, don't, do you do anything else? And I said, well... I used to occasionally write fiction, and he looks at me. He's sort of exasperation of, and you and you can do a business plan, and yet you never actually sat down and thought whether you could do that. And I said, I'll go and do it now because it came on like a light, you know, this revelation. And people don't like hearing that, unfortunately. That's why I, I sort of hesitate to tell people because everyone likes to think that it's this dream you've got since childhood and you finally make it. I just, I just needed the money. <laughs> I was just an old hey, hack. Every, <laughs> I think, wrong with that. I think oh, everybody has. Good. Everybody has a different uh, um, starting point, and I, I think re regardless of where your starting point is, as long as you get to where you were wanting to go, I yeah. think it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you should only be judged by the product. Mm. The problem is today exactly. is that there's an expectation that uh, that the customer will know the writer as well, right. mm. and right. never used to have that. I mean, all right, Dickens would go out and he would get abuse and things like that, right? Um, but you know what's what your motive is has to has to remain your own but what it means is that i haven't got any stories bursting to get out i never had any any sort of things like that driving me i, I never want, wanted to write the great novel but what i am as as an ex-journalist a proper journalist not what passes for journalism today i was interested in people and yeah people are endlessly fascinating That's and true. i just did it as a as, as a as a sort of all right if, if i'm going to write fiction What's the most f uh, forgiving genre where I can just drag in all sorts of stuff? Science fiction. Mm. Because I actually like like police procedurals best, but I wasn't going to write them, so I'd work for the police, and that stuff changes too fast. And I thought, no, I'm I'm actually going to stick to speculative fiction this time. And I did a bit of market research because I'm a sort of mechanistic, robotic sort of character that, you know, I've got to have all my numbers and my spreadsheets and all that before I start on anything. Oh, spreadsheets, and Scott. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah, spreadsheets, yeah, yeah, yeah. where is that? And, you know, I was, I was amazed. I, I actually asked people who bought books. I just say, yeah, why, why, are you, why are you buying that? Why do you buy a second book? Why do you buy the series? And it's for characters. Mm. And I thought, mm. well, right, if there's one thing I can write, it's people because, you know, A, I'm old and I've met a lot of all sort of conditions i've been a journalist so i've met some very you know the, you, you sort of get this database of human behavior you don't have to you don't have to um uh, uh be be shrink to know how people work when, right. when you spend a lot of time constantly meeting strangers all day and that's the thing it's meeting strangers all day and finding out everything about them i thought well i can do that in fiction so I basically think, right, you need to start from a certain point because you can't just say I'm going to invent some characters. So this is where it gets to be game stroke computer model thinking rather than literary thinking. It's what is, where are these people and what sort of person would be in that world? It's uh, almost a sort of environmental uh, evolutionary bi biology type thing. Yeah. And, then you, and then you populate that world and you build these characters in three dimensions and then you let them interact. Now, I'm not saying I'm utterly random <laughs> because nobody who loves spreadsheets as much as me can be utterly random. You have to know where you're setting off to before you can be diverted from it. That's <laughs> the view I take. Yeah. Um, a lot of this I owe to um, uh, Sean Stewart. I did Clarion in 2000. And, uh, I, I, I was a three by five card planner sort of thing uh, 20 mm. years ago. And uh, I hadn't written a novel or anything like that then. And, and and Sean said, I know everybody plans, but if you know what's coming, you're going to get bored. And whether he meant me, because he could see I had a sort of 
a very low board <laughs> threshold. <laughs> um, uh, and if you're bored, that's going to seep through onto the page. And I thought, right, I'm going to learn to take my hands off the wheel. So I did. And that was the best advice I ever had on writing. It really was. It was like, you know, just go with the cat, just go with the characters. I think he could he could see what I was forming that I actually had the raw material because I could build the characters and they could do the work. But mixing my metaphors and and, and analogies now, I treat it as a train journey. I know I've got to go to the station and buy a ticket, and I know I've got to say roughly where I want to go. But I know at some point the the people on the train with me are going to want to go somewhere else, and they're going to stop halfway along that journey, and I'm just going to have to follow them, listen to them, see what they see. And every book's like that. I don't think I can do that any differently. In terms yeah. of pro writing process, though, it's a matter of where you start. I've got much more linear as I've got older because I'm going, I think, deeper into the people. Right. Uh, there's no point in me writing, although sometimes it helps to write the end. So you've got some idea of the station you've missed. Just like a marker, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, You're just right. a marker. The target. Case yeah, you need to yeah push I've got a target, which, which you absolutely know you're going to miss. You know you're going to miss it. Right, but but yeah. you still have to have something in mind, you know, yeah. some general yeah. destination. You may not yeah. know the exact station you're going to, but you want to know the country. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I shall, I, shall, I shall steal that shamelessly. Please do. So, Please do. I would be honored. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of start at the beginning now, and I, and I sort of chug through. Um, and that's what I've done with this one. And, of course, then you end up doing a lot more of your thinking on the page. I say your thinking, you're doing the characters thinking, you're finding right. out stuff as they find it out. So I mean, that's, that's the appeal of writing for me. It's the novelty. I'm actually meeting these strangers and yeah. there's nothing more fascinating than someone else's brain. Well, I'm curious then, uh, I mean, obviously you've written in a whole, uh, a, a plethora of different worlds and settings. Um, but going back to that, first making that switch to uh, I, I'm going to leave my job or, or, and I want to become a writer. Um, so that first, that first book that you started um, after saying, you know, you, you need, you need to have this mapped out and, and, and kind of this uh, character and setting, what, what was it in that first book that, that you could just sit down and, and go? Um, and, and write that idea out. How did that come about? Oh, I'm trying to remember where it came from originally. I, I think it was about, I actually don't remember. I honestly, you know, seriously, I do yeah. remember 20 years ago. I do remember the iterations that it went through because in, initially it was uh, the two main, well, I say the main characters. It's the other complicating thing. I don't have main characters. They all get pretty much equal face time. Right. Know? Yeah, and uh, you know, I don't have favourite characters. There are there are characters I enjoy writing more than others because they're a technical challenge. And oh, I yeah. mean that's that's where I get the pleasure from. I don't get. Hmm. It's hard to engage with the characters when you are thinking through their head. It's not an external process for me. Does that make any sense? No. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that was that was a solvent talking. But well, if you if you <laughs> if you sit down and you like, for instance, if you're writing a, a, a serial killer, you have to get into that fr frame yeah. of of how does he view the world, yeah. and it's, it's yeah, there's exactly. something off about how he views the world, yeah. so it can't be how you view it. So that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're you're I mean, already in there. Yeah. I mean that's. That's the uh, the nearest the nearest thing to it is method acting, and I say that with some confidence because when I describe this to an actor, he says, "Oh, you're method acting, dear. You're method acting, of course." <laughs> and yeah, that's true because if I've sort of spent spent the morning regarding the world as normal through the eyes of, as you say, the serial killer, it's actually quite difficult to then shake yourself out. You have to actually have to say, "No, I've got to get back to being me because I've got to go down to Sainsbury's and get the groceries." And <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, don't, you don't want to go to the grocery store probably. as a serial killer. <laughs> Or maybe you do. You know? <laughs> maybe you do, yeah. But I mean, I um, things up in the line. My, yeah. My first series, it started out with uh, the sort of driving character, shall we say, who, who open it as as male, a male alien and a male uh, human cop. Okay. Which I've sort of, I mean, I do actually like doing these bromance things because men's relationships fascinate me because. This is and this is where I'm going to get a lot of people very angry. I think men are far more loyal to each other, and I think there's more bonding with men than ever is. I women. absolutely agree yeah, with that. Yeah, I find that fascinating. <laughs> I actually, I mean, men men are great. I know it's not a fashionable view these days, but I continue to hold it. And I realised that it didn't work. That the dynamics of the relationship, uh, that the um, that the alien is actually classed as a war criminal, and the uh, copper is disgraced. 
worked better because of the culture of the aliens, which is matriarchal, if the cop was a woman. And she was a right cow. I, people assume I'd like that character, that Sean Fang character. Seriously, if, if I was stuck in a lift with, with her, only one of us would come out. And I thought, <laughs> woman. Really me messianic. I mean, awful, awful woman. <laughs> that's but, that's uh, when you know you got cool. I mean, that, I mean, people have. This is the other thing about. I mean, you probably get it as well. People are always surprised that you're not your books. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Because people oh, expect definitely. you to write about you, yourself in a book. Right, right. That's the last person I want to write about because because oh. I know me, I want to stick my nose into everybody else's business. <laughs> and Much you know, there's, there's, there are all these people who thought that I was some sort of vegan, and I said, "Boy, have you got the wrong girl?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> chewing on, you know, chewing. Chewing on half a dead pig, sort of thing. It's, um, and it's, it really shocks them. It really does shock them. I mean, not everybody. <laughs> you got does. Josh. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you, Karen, but we have this thing where we always try to make Josh laugh when he's taking a drink of coffee. And you just nailed it. You just nailed it. I'm Ooh. sorry, Josh. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean that uh, that's sort of gratifying when that happens to you, though, isn't it? Because then you realise you have created something new. I mean, there's nothing worse than, than writing yourself in the books. I actually don't know how to do that. Somebody asked me that on another podcast about um, is is there any character that's like you? And I said no, because I don't. Um, I mean, obviously, we're all going to uh, agree at some point with some of our characters. We can't disagree with every single aspect of every single character's life, but. I don't know how people write themselves in, into stories. I, I just have no concepts of how that happens. It's the same way when you meet people that like, they'll like think they recognize themselves in your book. Mm. When, when I write police stuff, sometimes I have a lot of police officer friends and whatnot. And so I'm like, no, that's not you. you know, <laughs> no, no, nobody, nobody makes it in. Nobody gets into the story unchanged, yeah. you know, so to speak. Right. Well, and you gotta, that's, that's kind of self too, because you never know who's going to. Well, there are yeah. a few people that are shockingly that, that some, you know, you know, people in life who are like major personalities in real life. Mm. And sometimes some of their traits will, will, will pop through and you'd be like, sure. Oh, that's where that came from. Probably. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, oh. I used to work with a guy uh, in my TV days who went on to become a very successful novelist. And he really did. I mean, he, I'm not knocking the output. I'm just, it's the method that, that got to me. Um, he really did file the serial numbers off of people. And there was one that he wrote about somewhere where I worked and people were really getting quite annoyed about it. And you could really see, but the thing is, it was, he had actually put too much detail in that was distracting. I mean, you know, you know, when you're actually setting up a character, you've got to yeah. pare it down to essentials because the book view of the world is not the the world you see. You, you you're right. only seeing the headlines of that person. It's like right. the, you know, if you ask a toddler to draw an elephant seen from above, the toddler will draw something that looks like a tiger skin rug with the trunk out flat and the tail out yeah. behind the four legs because they haven't learned that sort of perspective. Right. And some people write characters like that. When in fact, what you just see is a figure eight with a couple of possible lumps on, on the outside. You're aiming for the figure of eight with the lumps. But he went on doing this. And eventually when he went into writing crime novels, he offended some serious villains and had to move out. <laughs> Let that be a warning to to, to everybody. Yeah. Do not yes. do not file the serial numbers of real people because some of them may be psychopaths. <laughs> so that's yeah, the awesome. time I was writing about a hitman, and then I died. <laughs> so he knew he knew they were real world bad guys, and he still went ahead. Oh yeah, because he used to do off. all his research with with the local cops. That is not right. Yeah, I said, <laughs> yeah, so what are you doing? You know, he's just. <laughs> Oh my you God. See this I mean, it's, it's one thing to piss off Betty in HR, but you right. know, <laughs> exactly. You, you don't want to tick off Joey the nose over there. <laughs> <laughs> Still, he he did do terribly well. So you know, so, you know, so kudos to him for that. He sold an awful lot of books. Bless him. Nice bloke, but just in hiding and <laughs> witness protection or something. Oh my God. <laughs> That's when you have that that little uh, disclaimer. The names have been changed to yeah. protect the innocent at the and beginning me. of your. <laughs> and me. How, how, how yeah. Go with that though, because I've got really paranoid. You know, paranoia is my middle name. Uh, I, I've got really worried about that because uh, there was there was a spate of um, 
people getting annoyed about places being used. I remember somewhere in the Philippines got annoyed because Dan Brown had put it in or somebody, and they and they complained about what the character thought about the Philippines. You know, it's like you've got to say nice things about this particular city. Uh, and yeah. uh, there was a uh, there was a city in England that got upset because it was portrayed as as rough as a dog's bum and violent. Well, it actually was rough as a dog's bum and violent, <laughs> but he objected to it. Right. So, so Indeed. when I did, uh, I've got a series set in the real world with real people and real references. And I made it, this is the Ringer series, Going Grey so far and Black Run. And I just lost my bottle over this and I just invented the small town and I invented it because I just couldn't bear the aggro, the threats and the severed horses' heads being delivered. Because <laughs> you've offended <laughs> someone up. from some tiny yeah. town, you know, it's That's the just not worth a hassle. Right. Yeah. Well, because then you could run into, like you're saying, like people assume that you're using them as characters and yeah. really you're not. Uh, I only use people in characters that I, I purposely ask. Can I use? I had a, a a sergeant on the police department that was probably the biggest asshole you could ever work with. <laughs> but he was a super smart guy. And I asked him, Hey, I need a really mean, competent person to have in, in my book. Uh, he's not going to be a sergeant. He's going to be a starship uh, for edge of valor. Yeah. And yeah. I said, he's going to be a starship captain. And he was like, absolutely. You can use me. And, uh, and at the time he was a sergeant and the Lieutenant, um, who was above him was also kind of a, an asshole too. And that Sergeant was like, as long as, yeah, as long as you use Zakowski as someone who works under me, then you can use my name. And I'm like, absolutely, <laughs> that's not a problem at all. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Yep. I have a similar problem with my Joshua Haynes character. It's like <laughs> he's a real person. <laughs> <laughs> my, that, my, my next main character is going to be Scoot Mounet. And uh, <laughs> it's French. Not, not referenced to anybody in particular. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the 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 Galaxy's Edge book, the best of us that you've written, um, uh, and the the series. Um, you mentioned you're doing, working on some rewrites for the second book, and that that your series, like I said at the beginning, is kind of the more detached from the rest of the timeline. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that story kind of manifested, and then uh, how it's going in the writing process with the with that? And is it going where you thought it was going to go when you started, or someplace different? Oh, they never go where I think that they're going to go. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's when I know at least I've got that right. If they go where I think they're going to go, then that's my story, not the character's story. So I'm right. so happy that it has gone off at a tangent and it's ended up in uh, the north of Scotland somewhere. But uh, um, I'll, I'll speak frankly. Um, Jason and Nick know, know all this, so I'm not speaking out of turn. Um, when Jason got in touch with me and said, would you like to write for us? I mean, seriously, I have so had... Uh, stories about blokes in unfeasibly large armor. I really, I can't do any more. I really yeah. have had enough. And you can yeah. understand that. I mean, I've sure. I've served my time. I've paid my debt to society. I, I really need to go free now. You know? <laughs> and, and I just kept saying no, because I just, you know, I didn't want to get back in. I, I'm, I'm actually trying to move stuff more towards uh, thrillers, um, even if they're sort of science-based sort of thing. Yeah. And I thought I was being pulled back to the mire. And you know, if you know you can do something, you know people will buy it. The 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 internal pressure as well as the external pressure to do it again and again and again is very very hard. But it never yeah. ends well because you will you will jump that shark sooner or later. Yeah. And right. uh, you know. Because because you lose the will to live over it. So I kept saying no. And then we, we had a conversation. I mean, I liked Jason and Nick. I got on with them really well. And that's a big factor because yeah. I know a lot of writers think, well, does it actually matter? Believe you me, it really matters when, when, you're, when you're working with people. Even if you have like peripheral involvement with them, nobody wants to work for a dickhead. Nobody wants to work right. for a dickhead. Right. Publishing is full of dickheadery. It really is. <laughs> so, you know, that's um, yeah. It's like any of the entertainment industry even at the sort of dilute and 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 like this it, it you know it does attract egos and when you meet people that you like working with it's actually a really valuable thing because it makes the working day go all right and Absolutely. i i think i think that shows in the finished item that you know that you don't want to kill the people you work with yeah i think that's a really important thing in a book. <laughs> not like god oh, all of you that's um, a good rule of thumb in general yeah that's a good thing <laughs> yes. so, it's like a google review uh, a great service didn't want to kill any of them 
you get a review and I'm like, this is a great book, but I'm pretty sure she's killed Jason eight times. And I don't know if it's a different person or the same. But I sort of started to weaken. Um, I said, all right, I will do something, but I don't want to get stuck with something that I can't do anything with. I don't want to get stuck. Um, I just don't want to go back to fitting in with other people's worlds particularly, although I thought theirs was terrific. Mm. But he said one thing that really got me, and he said, well, basically, uh, the the technocrats and the oligarchs who've, who've, who've left Earth and left all the plebs in the lurch don't get there first, the plebs do. And I thought, I'm in. Have I got <laughs> a story for you? Because you know? that really made me laugh. And also, you know, there's a little bit of the old knife twisting there, right? Yeah. Right. Where did your money get you now, mate? Sort of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, when, when they when they shot their house. So I said, how about an origins type thing about how how the FTL became uh, widely used by humans and how they overtook the light huggers? Yeah. Now you need that is so far in the past that. You know, you, you're, you're not going to mesh with that for a very, very long time. But it did enable me to actually say this: these are the circumstances under which a world starts to uh, leave, and these are the people who get left behind, and why, and how it happens. And of course, well, you, you know that overkill is is a really big thing for me. Uh, <laughs> I sort of, I sort of went back all to all my emergency planning stuff that I used to do. Uh, yeah as in FEMA type emergency planning stuff for okay, local yeah. authority. And I actually did a disaster cascade of, of what it would take for people to get to the stage of thinking it is worth going to another planet now. And that was that was the most useful thing, actually, you could see what was breaking down. Now, this is the morbid how bit. Does, how does that disaster cascade fit in with 2021 or 2020? Because I think it's probably hit <laughs> pretty close. Oh, it, <laughs> I absolutely hit it. I absolutely hit it because half half of it half of it was pandemics. Because this has been people have been going on about this for a long time. It's that is the cost of a connected world, and uh, I've actually got the document and I have shown it to people. So it, it, you know, if you fancy taking a look, I'm quite I'm quite proud of my predictive skills. Actually, it's not oh, that yeah. hard to predict. This is the route we're going down. But for, yeah, from a personal and morbid point of view, I don't have infinite time left to me on the clock. Um, I'm a, I'm an old person, and I've got a lot of books that haven't been written yet that are sitting there. That I'm desperate to do, and I'm thinking I am going to be dead before I get to that. And it's kind mm. of hard to get paid when you're dead. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I sort of joke about it, but it does give you a sense of panic that you want to get things done. And I thought, you know what? I could take that book that I've got on the back burner there called Brigade about people who about you know, a sort of army unit that was abandoned. And I could take my other uh, tentative series, Tox, which was about a, uh, a, a pandemic. I mean, that this was, and I had all this research, which I'm determined to use, you know, because I don't waste anything. And right. I thought I could bolt those two together and that would fit that really, really well. So I had a couple of the characters from that. Uh, one was the character that became Chris Montello. Um, and and that, opening that, that opening to the best of us is pretty well how I would have started Tox. So I thought, I can do this. I can actually get some enthusiasm for this. I don't have to get back into doing chaps in armor. Um, I can do it. I can stick with the military thing, which is what I like. I mean, that's what I do. I basically do military fiction. It doesn't matter what era or planet or whatever is set in military political stuff. Yeah. And I said, all right, we'll give it a go. At, um, I sort of started and the characters then just took it over, basically. And they just come out of nowhere and gone off. And it's going to places that, I mean, once you start thinking it through, this is the point. Once you have them in that situation and go, what would they do next? What would he do next? No, he wouldn't do that, but she would. And then why didn't they Why didn't they think about that? Why doesn't that happen? And then that starts to gradually veer, veer you off somewhere else. I, I was initially trying to bridge it to meeting the first light huggers. I don't think it's going to get there. I think it's going to another very different place, which is the problem about the technology. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I mean I don't I don't want to give any spoilers for Mother Death, but I think people can sort of see the direction of travel in the book if they've read the epilogue, um, and that really is where it jumps off. It, it's is what that epilogue meant, and what happens next, and the path they're on, and the decision I, they've taken. 
I absolutely love the titles of both books. And I'm wondering, does that factor into your story development at all? Or does that does that title arise out of the story creating process? Or how do you get such good titles? I do it both ways. I mean, I've, I've always been able to pick my titles, uh, with the exception of one book, which uh, uh, which was for a franchise. But um, uh, that doesn't matter because that was a movie. And you've got to have it matching. Um, right. Sometimes I get a title and think, I'd really like to write a book around that title because that sounds like it could be fun. And sometimes, uh, more often than not, though, it's the actual theme. That's when I know I've got the theme nailed, is that everything fits that title. I'm, uh, I'm curious, you know, with all the, the tie-in stuff uh, that you have done and um, – and uh, your your thrillers that you're talking about um, over over the the life of your career. What do you think are the funnest um, projects to work on? The ones where you can kind of create from whole cloth, and it's all of you, or you can take like different pieces of of like for instance, the best of us, where you're you're taking some of what happened in the Galaxy's Edge, but you're still kind of creating because that that wasn't written in the books. Um, just the uh, the idea of the light huggers and all that. What, what's the most fun for you in the creative process? Um, that's hard to answer because all the um, all the times I've done have been create new material. Mm. Uh, it's not as if I mean, with you know, with very few exceptions, I really haven't had any constraints. I mean, however, however much I say I wish I'd never written times, and I do say that I think it was a bad idea. And uh, it was you know, it was great to stay doing things like eating and having a roof o over your head. But <laughs> I, I, right. I walked into it blind. I didn't know what they were. I just did the best book I could and I made stuff up. And that it meant oh. immediately you got a typecast for if you've got a problem, she'll fix it. You know, I was a sort of like the B team <laughs> rather than the A team. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, the actual fun wasn't. I mean, the whole the whole thing about whether you have creative freedom is an illusion you don't have creative freedom within your own stuff really once you've put two or three pegs in in the in the ground with your creator own stuff you're stuck with it yeah and canon canon is a bitch whichever whether whether it's yours or someone else's you know I, right. I've, I've hardly noticed the difference because there's a couple of things where i've thought well oh, i wish that had happened in a, i wish i'd done that in the previous book and then the other voice in my head you know the voices they talked to me said actually it wasn't you remember it was the character doing it so there's nothing you could have done about it anyway so stop beating yourself up you did what the character would do but you think oh perhaps you've gone a different way the fun i get from it isn't that isn't particularly that um what i like doing really love doing is comics i've done a lot of comics mm. i love doing comics i work i love working with artists that's the absolute best thing in the world I work with how, like so how is the story how is the creation I, i've i've i mean I've, I've read a little bit of comics but i'm not huge into comics what how's the story creation uh different there when you're working with artists and and writing scripts how does that differ from writing a novel um in a novel, you've got to show you're working. In a comic, you can get away with a lot less. In a game, even less than that, because it's not a linear story in any way. And, you know, right. obviously, I've, I've sort of moved between media. I've actually had a TV background. So, I mean, sorry, I thought I'd mention that. This, I am a visual person who happens to write novels uh, rather than someone who had to learn to be visual. Um, sorry, I, I've sort of uh, diverted myself there because you've asked a really interesting question about the difference between novels and, 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 and other media. Um, the best explanation, I'll try and do this one quickly. I read it in uh, a book about filmmaking. It, it used to be called in film schools, the Indian behind the tree, as an example. Uh, imagine you're watching a Western, you know, a sort of 50s Western. You've got the cowboys talking about a campfire, shot pulls back and there's a tree and there's an Indian brave listening and his horse is nearby. And he hears whatever they're doing and rides off to tell. Uh, the chief what's happening you couldn't do that in a novel you couldn't just do that as that shot sequence you know mm. uh, close up on the campfire pull back cut to the face of the uh, of the brave um yeah. then you see him move and you see the horse go off in the distance because in a novel you'd have to say how did he understand what they were saying where did he learn english um right. why did yeah. i hear his horse gallop away and you know there's all these little things that, that a novel, you know, it's, it's obviously the much bigger, slower tanker to turn around. Whereas you can, you can actually skip that. Having said you can skip that, uh, 
there are people who don't and the whole um manga and 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 an anime in industry shows they really will do all that novel level detail and that's what makes them so enjoyable i mean that is my thing that's what i really like to do that's what i like, like to watch and read uh because the storytelling is so rigorous but but in terms of comics the process to work with an artist i mean i there are as many ways of working with an artist as there are doing anything else. I mean, you can either say to an artist, I just want a page of this. I, because I've come from a background where I've done scripts and, and the storyboards and everything, I, I just automatically did a fully directed script, shot size, where it cuts. But I say to the artist, if you don't agree with any of that, if any of that doesn't work for you visually, then, you know, by all means, come back and, and, and do it. And the artists I've worked with have said, really terrified when they saw the scripts to start with because it was like a really tightly directed script and then they realized that they could have a lot of fun with that and the greatest thing in the world and it's hard to describe is when you is is when you sent the script to the artist and you start to get the pencils back and even though they've stuck with what you said it's a whole new world you're looking at a totally different yeah. creation because of the detail uh, the way they interpreted the uh, the sort of facial characteristics. I mean, classic example, uh, working with Steve Kurth, I absolutely worship Steve. So, I mean, he's, he's such a great artist. Working on G.I. Joe with him, uh, he would do a character in the background. If, if I just said there's a crowd in the background, he would put a really interesting person in the background and I'd say, can you, can you make a note of him? Because I'm going to give him his own backstory. Because, and... They will spark you off to do other things. You will think that is a really yeah. I hadn't thought of that. I'm going to take the story off somewhere else. And that and that is the thrill of working with an artist. I like working with people who've got different disciplines to me. Yeah. Uh, that's why I like games because you, you you get to work with so many different people. And that and that does raise, raise your game. It really does make you a better writer. I think. No, I can absolutely see that because how many times you see like really fabulous art and you're like, that's got to be, that's a, that's why I have so many book covers I buy that I haven't written books for because I'm like, oh, that, that's a story. And then, <laughs> and then I yeah, exactly. don't have time to write it. So I have these huge investments, but, but yeah, I, when I was uh, a very young officer a long time ago, I was working a part-time job at a Denny's with another officer who was an artist and we were going to write a comic book together and he would bring me the sketches and, I remember that kind of that same thing. It's very inspiring because it's like magic, you know. The, exactly. That's it exactly so word. magical. Yeah. That's it. I mean, I can watch someone draw. I know how they do it. Can I do it? No. Yeah. You always want to though, and then you try and you go, no. I'm yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and after, so I'm curious too, is it working with the artists and after working with them for you know a couple of panels or a couple of books or however you uh, do the. The, the work does the art kind of start speaking to the story as well or is that oh, does the art yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. Off from the start yeah i mean i if i always want to know who the artist is that i've got if it isn't someone i've asked for because i will write to their strengths mm. because it, it is a visual medium and there is no point writing a story that's great that an artist you know cannot cannot do for you you have to find what find what they do best and everyone's got their separate skills. And one of the things that Steve Kerr could do that I don't think anyone ever asked him to do before, but he suddenly did it, was he can do these portraits. You know, on the splash page, you, you've got a, a full page right. where you can really right. look at a character. And he could do the most astonishing facial detail that really made you think, oh, I actually know that character I've written. That's fantastic. You could, re you know, I know that sounds all sort of flaky, but he, no, he did no, that so no, many no, times. No. He was, brilliant at it i mean he's, he's i mean he's a great action artist but these sort of portraits these sort of pin up uh, things were absolutely superb and they really did make me think differently about the character and more depth to them i uh i think i i mean i'm when you say visual like i when i write um there was a a, a battle scene that i wrote for uh, the, the last terra nova book hail's war um and i wrote right after watching um avengers um, and I had all of that visual um, fodder just at my fingertips. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is really good. I'm, I'm stealing Avengers. Um, but I would I would really I think that would be really cool is to do something like like comics where you're you're writing, but you can create things based on how they're going to look on the panels and not just how the words that you use to describe yeah. them. I think that that would be really fun to see. They There's do change the, the way you write, though. 
this is the weird thing. After I've been doing a long run of comics, I realised how much shorter everything. I just cut out too much. You you haven't got a lot of space. Uh, oh, yeah. You need to make it immediate. And it changed my writing style. And I had to ease myself back to the more uh, sort of uh, conversational style of dialogue. Yeah. Because you don't have the back and forth. Right. You don't have room for like five yeah, or six. Of- yeah, no, what? I know. You don't have the, have the room to do that. So that was something I wasn't expecting uh, to, it's rather like if people text, they're incapable of writing a letter afterwards. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like right. But, um, yeah. So. Yeah, I always go if I, stuff really. That's what I like doing. <laughs> if I if I go to like do a, a messenger on my phone, but I know it's going to be a long message, I'll just set it down and go to my computer and type it yeah. out on my computer. It's way faster than my thumbs. Oh yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I just voice text and let you figure yeah, it out. I, yeah. I hate doing anything on my phone. I just got these sausages for fingers that just. So if we're talking, up. we're talking about the inspiration of the artistic. Obviously, is very influential. And what about music? Do you have any? Do you listen to background? Because we've talked a lot about like our our sound reels when we're when we're writing. No, I definitely do. don't listen to music because it just distracts me um, because I'm listening for all, all sorts of things. And especially if there are lyrics, I just, you know, that really messes with, with yeah, the voices I can't do lyrics. in my yeah. head. Yeah. You know. um, I mean, keeping, keeping the voice of the character in sort of audio terms in your head is critical, which is why I never listen to audiobooks of my own stuff if, while I was writing the series because hearing Ooh. the wrong person, I mean, especially with Gears, um, I was so used to those voices, and I, you know, I was in the studio for the game, and you knew you you wrote to those people's voices and their and their uh, speech patterns and the yeah, character speech patterns. Right. And then if you, I, I sort of listened to a couple of minutes of somebody doing the audio book, and I thought I can't because I won't be hearing Fred's voice, or I won't be hearing, um, you know, um, Nan, Nan's voice or any of those. It's just. It, it was it was actually very difficult, and I suddenly realised it. And it's a very fragile thing, you know. When you create, you know what it's like. You know, you're actually you are trying to hold an incredibly complex three dimensional diagram in your head, and you've got to switch that on and off every right. time. And the the fact there is no real reference to it makes it makes it very fragile. Um, there was a time when I was younger, actually, fifteen. Let's see, fifteen years ago, I actually wrote a novel in the very room I'm sitting in now, while I had carpenters in doing the door with a router. (laughs) And I was oblivious. Now, and part of it is age and part of it is life events have sort of uh, uh, of put me in a state of um, sort of being being on amber half the time and waiting for for emergency calls. And the smallest thing will throw me off and I've got to go back and do it again, you know. Um, Yeah. That's that's why it's a good idea for me to take a run at it, you know, just sort of keep on the coffee and just sit down and do it the way I used to in my in my younger middle aged days. What's the best time for you to write? Like Scott, he can pretty much write whenever. If I don't get it done in the mornings, I'm really crappy for the rest of the day. If I don't get it done the the big parts in the mornings, what what's the most opportune time for you to get your words done? Oh dear. Well, um, it's actually more about when I've got, you know, when I've got interruptions during the day from other things, yes. that's, that's my problem. There are things to yeah. get done. And I try to do, I've had this, I had this conversation with the uh, book designer the other day, cause he's got the same, I mean, he's, he's got a really rigid schedule other than his own. I mean, you know, he's actually got a dairy farm. Cows don't wait. Cows want you up four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Cows are right. Cows are right. right. I yeah. want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, get out here and milk me. <laughs> Yo, uh, yeah, and uh, we were sort of discussing, you know, what was what was the best time of day to do things, and I said, well, I sort of get my jobs done first, and I've got the rest of the day clear. And I said, and then I find that the whole day gets taken up by, you know, demands on your time. So he, he said he had started to to work very early in the morning. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you get earlier than four o'clock in the morning. I mean, the man is the man is I, must my, be made my unbelievable. Most my most productive year when I started work at 6.30 and I had to drive to work so that I would get up at 3 and I'd try to write, get two hours in before I went to work. And that way, no matter what else happened throughout the day, yeah. I could always count it as a win. That didn't yeah, always work. Yeah. But, yeah. you know. I think that is definitely the plan. So that's what I'm trying to do now. And um, <clears throat> David Goffert's uh, newsletter, he's, he, he sent out a wonderful little list of, of things about, you know, do not open your e- email. You know, 
yeah. uh, just sit yeah. down and write. Do not open your email. Do not read the news. Do not do this. Do not do that. Just write. Then do the other things because you know that you're gonna. There's gonna be people want to do things and you're gonna be diverted. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm Don't now gonna go back. To, Don't feed yeah, your kids. So, Don't yeah. do any of that. They can, yeah. they can just wait. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Because one thing leads to another. Done, though. Yeah, that's true. Well, then with with me with kids, you start up getting up earlier and earlier. Well, they start up getting earlier and earlier. <laughs> I'm like, this is not a competition. I, no, I right. <laughs> the uh, the year before I went full time when I was still working at the police department, I was I I got on Scott's schedule and I was basically trying to get up at four. Um, because I would have to start getting ready for work at seven. And so that would give me, well, realistically, it'd give me like two and a half hours. So I hit the snooze button like three times before I got out of bed. Um, but then my son would get up like 15 minutes after I got downstairs and started typing on the keyboard. And I'm like, are these keys like super loud? What's, what's going on? Like every time I touched the keyboard, the kid woke up and that was, it was crazy. Cause yep. then he, You'd have to get them juice and then bottle and everything else. And I'm like, well, I just got up at four for next absolutely thing you know, nothing. Next thing you That's know, you're milking cows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone who works at home has that has that problem now. I think what we've got is a whole world now, half of which has, has realized what it's like to work at home. People are saying, oh, you're, oh, you're sat there. You can do this as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. I, don't really, I don't like to consider it working at home. I like to consider it living at work. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So, when do you think uh, uh, the second Best of Us book will come out, or what's your most uh, nearest release that you have coming up? Um, I think I'm, I want to get uh, Mother Death out next, which is the sequel. Um, that that is actually close to being finished because simply because I'm 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 steeled myself not to write not to rewrite again. Actually, it's just getting crazy. I actually yeah. said to Jason, <laughs> "That's it." I'm I'm sort of done. Yeah, yeah. I'm done on that date, and then we'll worry about how how bad it is when the editor sees it. But <laughs> if you hit the good thing is I've got another rise. eight eight versions I can go back to. You know, it's um, right. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, well, we do look forward to for to see that book coming out, and uh, uh, it's it's a planned trilogy. I thought that's what. It, the series yeah, was, or is it, it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's see where it goes after that, and it and it, and it might go places where where it doesn't fit. But uh, certainly the certainly the uh, three books will be you know, uh, consistent with GE canon. So, and I know it's very separate, but uh, uh, that's often the best way to to do things. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, and well, and you get, I think, with any with any universe type setting, it, it, you know, it's it's fun to do different things in that in that universe. Like, uh, you know, uh, Doc Spears is doing his really kind of operator type, sp yeah. uh, special operator type uh, books, and so it's it's interesting to see the the different takes on it. So, um, but uh, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and and spending time with us this morning. It's been fun talking with you. Thank you. It's been fun see seeing you all, even if you can't see me. <laughs> um, everybody in the live chat, thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us uh, this morning. Um, I think we had uh, a whole bunch of people. Corvo finally joined. But Corvo says, Kara Travis. Corvo came in at the last minute. Uh, way to five, always, five always uh, coming Four. in at the last minute. Where to, where, way to go. Um, who do we have? I, I have a, I have it on the calendar awkwardly enough for who's coming on next week and of course now the calendar's not pulled up hold on let me look let me see Good job. winning let me see hey at least it's on the calendar this time it's pretty impressive uh, yeah. that actually is a step forward yeah oh uh, actually i have two weeks on the calendar so let's wow. see wow yes yes um let's see we have casey azell and uh griffin barber coming on next week to talk about their um dual novel it's like a sci-fi noir uh cop i think investigation um they're going to come on next monday and then after that ian j malone is going to come on on the 21st uh to talk about his book so those will be uh some good episodes you don't want to miss if you're just joining us on youtube 
uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Um, and if you're listening on the audio feed on iTunes or Podbean, wherever you listen, we do live shows every Monday, uh, depending on the time. Usually it's 10, but sometimes it's other times. Uh, the Writer's Journey on Thursdays with Kayleen uh, and Lauren. Uh, they're actually, they started back last week. So they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're, good. they're a really good show last Last they're going to be there. Let's see. Who do they have on this week? Ron Christie and race and monitor America, I think is coming on uh, this Thursday night. Um, and then Walt Robillard will be on with coffee and concepts, I think tomorrow morning. And then if you guys didn't notice, Josh guy, you just did another uh, long form conversation. He had Nicholas Sansbury Smith. I think Dean M Cole Cole and uh, Craig Allenson. Uh, he sat down and talked with, and that's, that's on the huge. show. That's on the channel now. So oh, big deals. Yeah, it was a pretty cool uh, interview. It was uh, about an hour and a half long or something. It was, it was a really cool conversation. So uh, subscribe and you'll get notified when all of those things uh, hit the airways and you'll be able to watch. Um, Karen, again, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure. It's, it's been a pleasure here too. <laughs> Remember, cows won't wait. That's yeah, the cows, 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 cows won't wait. Won't wait and cows you, won't can, wait. you can ventilate your, your painting, but it's still going to come inside. I wonder if you could vent, you you ventilate book. the cows and see how that works. <laughs> you could combine activities. I'm pretty yes. sure they wouldn't mind. Exactly. What are you doing? Uh, all right. Painting and milking. Make sure you come back and hang out with us next week. We're going to talk about some writing and some reading and, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Media. Later, everybody. Cows won't.